Good evening. I'm sorry for that delay. I had a little problem here. But anyway, hello world. And may the Holy Spirit this night open the eyes of our understanding, grant us direction for life, open our eyes to see the Lord Jesus, and make this scripture alive to every one of us. We are looking at the last verse of Psalm 23. I don't know how many weeks we've been in this psalm, but um, I'm not going to finish tonight. I thought I would, but the way it looks, um, we are going to be here one more week. And so Psalm 23 and verse 6, um, I think you, you've read this a number of times already. Um, David said, surely goodness and loving kindness shall, and remember, relentlessly pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This last phrase, it, it sums up all of David's longing, all of his expectancy that he has been expressing all the way through this psalm. In fact, um, as we go through what I'm going to say tonight, think in terms that this last verse, and specifically the expression, house of the Lord, that is what we were talking about when we said shepherd. That's what we were talking about with the green pastures, the still waters, the paths of righteousness, the restoring of the soul. This is what it is, that he is with me in the valley of the shadow of death. Here is the table set before me. Here is the oil poured upon me. It's, it's all here in this one phrase, as if he's gathering it all up together and, and he's saying, this is my longing and my expectancy. Know that he's moved from any sort of praying and he's declaring this, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, in order to understand this, and this is why it's going to take two weeks, um, we've got to get inside his head to understand what he means when he says the house of the Lord. Uh, and I, I don't want to make anybody feel bad, but most people that I've spoken to over the years, when it says house of the Lord, they, they mean a church building. Lord, help us and save us from that. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It's got nothing to do with that. And, and don't, don't be upset because you're not alone just for um, the whatever. I, I, I checked all of my commentaries. What do the great uh, Bible scholars of the ages say about this expression? Do you know that they all said the same thing? That this means the gathering of the congregation on Sunday morning. Now please, erase that from your mind. Erase it. We are going to go into the Old Testament and find out what was in David's head. What did he mean in his heart when he said that he would dwell in the house of the Lord? And, although we won't really get there tonight, but what did he mean forever? So these are expressions, and we've said them over and over and over again, and so many times without any thought of what they mean. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is not a random thought of David. You know, it just he tosses it out that he would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I would say that this expression along with many other expressions that mean the same thing, is front and central to David's heart desire. And it's expressed all the way through the Psalms. In a sense, he never really stops talking about this, longing for this, desiring it, or delighting in what this means, dwelling in the house of the Lord. So. Let, let's put it like this. The expression house of the Lord is a shorthand. That, that, that's, that's what it is. It, it's a sort of spiritual shorthand. 
It's a symbol, uh, a symbol that conveys what it symbolizes. So shorthand, a symbol for the central message of Scripture, and certainly the Gospel. And so if we don't understand this, there's, there's a lot of things we won't understand. So this is a very important expression worth spending a couple of weeks on. So go back to the beginning. I mean, the beginning. Why are we here? For what reason did the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit conspire to create you and I? Just sit back and let that sink into your heart. What is God's intention in bringing mankind into being? And let me state this, and I'll state it again next week, that the intention, love's intention, the God who is love, his intention in creation, and specifically creation of you and I, mankind, his intention was to bring us into what I call the circle of his love. That is, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and the Holy Spirit glorifies and loves the Father and receives the Father's love even as he glorifies the Son and receives the Son's love. And herein is this circle that as I have often called it, the dance, for it is in perfect harmony. And sometimes the spotlight is on the Father, sometimes on the Son, sometimes on the Holy Spirit, but it's that circle. Uh, God is in Himself relationship. He is this intensity of activity, an activity that is love. And He created us to bring us into the circle to use another way of putting it, to, to bring us into the family circle so that we might sit at the kitchen table of the Holy Trinity and, and there be the adopted sons and daughters, part of the family of God. And, and, and that for, for real, not as some religious phrase, but for real being part of that. That is, we would be part of, we would be participating in that limitless love. Who is the Holy Trinity? So, you and I were created to be at home inside the love of God. How can I put that so that we all understand? We're wired for that. that. That's the reason you are now listening to this. The reason that you woke up this morning and walked around your house and went to the store and did your job. That behind all of that is that we were created to be and do and live inside the love of the Father because the, the Son has come to bring us into that and to open our eyes and join the dance through the Holy Spirit. That's the meaning of life. That is the ultimate reality, that you and I are creatures of two worlds simultaneously. We live inside the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while at the same time we're working in our office and, and we're eating our dinner and we're playing with the children and we're doing the garden, cleaning the house. We're people of two worlds. That's why we're here. That's life. And without that, we, we are not fully alive. And, and you see, Another way I've said this, and these are not kind of quotes to be blazed out as ultimate theology. They're just trying to make us understand that we were created, batteries not included. For, for we are not independent. We, we do not just be in, in the great wide universe. We were created to be joined to life real aliveness, 
And that aliveness is the relationship that exists inside of God. And we were created to be joined to that. And then we are alive with his life. And, and, and we do our work from him. He is our life. And out from us extends that life which is divine love to the whole of creation. Sin is the breaking of that relationship. You see, how different things appear when you, you begin with who is God. Because many people think that sin is the breaking of a law. And, and, and so suddenly, well, who is God? Well, he, he's then the great law giver, the sovereign governor of the universe who hands out his laws, and we broke the law. And the whole thing is so impersonal, there's no relationship there any more than there's a relationship between me and the state trooper that stopped me when I broke the law of the speed limit, you see. No, no, God isn't a state trooper. God isn't the legislative body of the universe. God is not the great sovereign governor. He's Father. He loves you. And what sin is, the breaking of the relationship with the one who is love. Breaking the relationship. Now that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. And instead believing the lie, the great illusion, the, uh, which meant entering into the great darkness. And that illusion is that I'm independent that I can live with God up there, over there, marginalized. And I'm here, the little God of creation, my world. God excluded, his love excluded, uh, hopefully there somewhere to be called upon for a bit of help when I need him. But the Bible calls that death. Death in the sense I'm divorced from real life. I'm not really alive. I'm not really the authentic human being I was created to be. But instantly, as soon as man did that, right there in Genesis chapter 3, immediately the God who is love breaks in, not to announce punishment, but rather to announce he will not let them get away with it. But there shall be one who is the seed of the woman. Right there you have an echo of the virgin birth. And, and that seed of the woman will crush the head of a liar, the snake, who spewed out the lie and injected that lie into the human race. And so right from the beginning, his determination is to reveal that he is love and he will not let us go. And he will achieve his love purpose. But, <clears throat> how can I put this? Sin, this breaking of the relationship, is so deep. It is so dark. It is so unlife that man couldn't see it, couldn't understand it. His brain is addled by the lie. And therefore it will take time. And God enters into the due process of revealing himself to mankind. That he is not the ugly, distorted, twisted face that the liar has injected into the human race. But that he is love. He is limitlessly pro-human. And he will not rest until we are joined to him. And so he enters into the human race to reveal himself, to let his light shine into that darkness. And where are you going to begin? This is, this is the story of the Bible. What a story. He, he's got to have a place. He's got to have a foothold to get into the human race. And that foothold was the family of Abraham. And, and Genesis 12, he, he joins himself to the family of Abraham, makes covenant with that family. And through this family, he will reveal who he really is. 
He will reveal the reality of life. And that's the story. It unfolds. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's name changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons, and so the 12 tribes of Israel. And Israel became the carriers, the bearers of the only truth to all the nations of the world they became those who brought the light of the knowledge of who God really is and what his purpose really is I'm skipping over <clears throat> uh, centuries here but um, he made himself known to Abraham but as that family became a great people and a nation after they left Egypt he determines he will come and live with them you've got to understand this it's so neat that they're wandering uh, a bunch of wanderers in the wilderness living in tents after they've left Egypt and so this God who will not let the human race go says I'm going to come and live with you well, how are they living? In tents. So God says, I'll build me a tent. It's called the tabernacle, but that's just a very old word for tent. He planted his tent in the middle of their tents. If you're camping in the wilderness, I'll go camping with you. I'm not going to let you go. And so he made his home with the Israelites in their desert wanderings. In the harshness of the wilderness, there was God in his tent. But, what well, that tent, there's, there's a whole nother 17 hours if we wanted to get into it. I don't. But there, there was a tent, and, and there was an outer court, and then there was a holy place. And then in the very heart of that tent, there was the holiest of all, holiest of holies. And it was that inner room. And just for information for the next, uh, probably next week, that inner room was called, in the Greek language, naos. Very important. It, it was, shall I say, the, the room of the presence. It was separated off from the rest by, by a curtain. And, and the furniture in that room consisted of what was known as the Ark of the Covenant. And, and it was a box overlaid with gold and on the top there was this golden what was called the mercy seat or the seat of loving kindness the seat of the covenant it was a small box it was approximately four feet by two feet by two feet but above that slab of gold of the loving kindness of God there was a presence it would be hard to describe it it was uncreated light. It was radiance. The Bible uses the word glory. The word in Hebrew, Shekinah. And, and, and that glory was the very presence of God within, inside the creation. It was that geographical point on the face of the earth where God, creator, lover, was with his people who in turn were to share that with the rest of the world here they are the glorious radiance of covenant love who was with them and he said to Moses now really here and if you're taking notes Exodus 25 22 speaking of that box with its slab of gold he says there I will meet with you and then he goes on and says I will speak to you so here is the radiance this glory of God and he says to Moses that's the point that's the place that's the geographical point where I will meet with you now that's the neatest word <laughs> In the Hebrew language, meet with you, to meet, it means, I mean, it means to meet, as, as a good translation, but it was used to describe making and keeping appointments. I like that. 
He says, at this point, I'm making an appointment to meet with humankind. Here is God in radiant glory, which is a, a symbol in itself of love that reaches out and enlightens the darkness. And there he is above this Ark of the Covenant, shimmering, uncreated, glorious, radiant light. And he says, there I make my appointment to meet with humankind. Now talk to you, Moses. It, it was used, can you hear this? It was used to describe an engaged couple, lovers, who would meet together and converse. What, what, a, what a picture. The God says, I will come and be with my people. And from this tent, among your tents, I'll keep my appointment with you. I'll talk to you. I'll speak my word from this tent, from this place of glory. And it will be like two lovers coming to tryst. And he says, there I will speak with you. And that pretty much means what it says, but it means a little bit. It means commune together. It means conversation. And remember, it's that appointment-keeping God, that, that coming together of love. And he says, I'll commune, I'll converse with you. But it also means I'll sing to you. Have you ever thought about that? That he delights over you and sings a song of love. It means there I'll make my promises to you. There I'll teach you and open your eyes. There it was, planted right in the middle of the tents of the twelve tribes of Israel. God says, I'll be with you in, in this fashion. And he also said in Deuteronomy that it was the place where he would put his name, which um, is another word in the Old Testament which in basic English means I'll put the very my personal presence and so it, it came from the tent the people would go to the tent to worship God they go to the tent to offer their sacrifices the shedding of blood and the personal presence of God there assured them that they were meeting their lover who was in that inner room behind the curtain where the radiance of his glory shone. It's where he established his name. But, as I said, they were in darkness and even these Israelites, they, they were only at the beginning of the introduction to the preface of the first volume of understanding who God really is. They still had warped and distorted ideas of him. And they were, and get this very carefully, they were humans. Okay, think this, I'm using my words carefully. They were humans. And God, in the fullness of his presence, was in that tent, behind a curtain. I mean, yeah, he was close. He was closer to them than any other people on the earth. But close yet removed, you understand? They were humans. He was God. And they couldn't come any closer than the outskirts of the tent. Once a year, the high priest bearing the blood of the animal of the Day of Atonement would go behind the curtain, sprinkle the blood, but only once a year. And he went, and symbolically in his dress, he carried on his shoulders and on his heart every member of Israel as if representing them to this presence who lived among them as their lover. Close, couldn't be closer in many respects. But they were the humans on the outside, and he was God on the inside, separated by the curtain. And so, the, the, they understood. I, I say that maybe with a question in my voice. 
But out of this, do you remember the greeting? They didn't say hello to each other every morning when they met on the street. They, they said, the Lord be with you. And it was over against what I've just said. They knew they were the only nation. They, they, the Lord was with them. He had a tent with their tents. And so they said, the Lord be with you, as if to remind each other, we, we are the people with whom the Lord, the God who created all things, who is life himself, he lives with us. And not only lives with us, but he is covenanted in his love to be joined to us. He's one of us. And out of that came the name of the coming one, Emmanuel, which means God is with us. What a story. If I finished right there, what a story. It's incredible. As the centuries unfolded, the people forgot and their leaders forgot that he lived among them to develop relationship. And they turned this whole thing into law that were mere commands of a demanding God. And the Ark of the Covenant, that golden box with the glory of God, that Ark became to them a magic, what shall I say, talisman. It was magic to them. It was, he's the God of power. And we can use him and manipulate him to protect us, do us good, like a lucky charm. Incredible, isn't it? And on one day, the Philistines, their continual enemies, came against them to take over their country. And they went out to fight and they said, we're, we're losing. And somebody said, go get the ark. And so as if someone had forgotten to bring their lucky apple or their rabbit's foot, they ran back and they got the ark out from behind the curtain and they brought it to the battlefield as if now we've got our lucky charm with us, we'll win. But you see, God will never be treated as a good luck charm. He'll never be treated as a formula for success. And so he allowed the ark of his presence to be captured and taken by the Philistines. That's a story in itself because they put it in the idol temple of their god. They worshipped a great fish called Dagon. And they put this little box and they, they didn't understand it and there, there was no presence they could see. And so they said, look, Dagon, we've captured the Israelite God. And they put the box in front of their hideous idol. And in the morning when they came back to their temple, their fish God was all smashed to pieces. And they recognized that whatever this box was and whoever the God was who was connected with this box was bigger than Dagon. And so they put it on a cart with oxen and sent it back into Israel and it came lumbering on this ox cart in a place called Kiriath Jerem and it was in the farmhouse of a chap called Abinadab and so he put it in the front living room what's he going to do the ark of God is it it's incredible to me but back in Israel nobody cared for 20 years, that's a long time, 20 years during the whole reign of Saul, they went on in the tabernacle with all their sacrifices as if nothing had happened. Did you realize that they're going through every ritual, every day, just the same, but there's no presence. The light to the glory of God is not there. They've just got an empty room there, but nobody bothers. Just go through the same stuff month after month. And it's as dead as a dinosaur. There's no presence. For the presence was in a ranch down in Kiriath Jerem in the farmhouse of Abinadab for 20 years. David comes 
to know God at a very early age. And when I say know God, I mean he came to know that God has entered into covenant with us, that he is pro us to the nth degree, that he acts toward us in goodness and loving kindness and faithfulness. And he dwells among us above the ark. And when he was made king after Saul, he made it the number one priority. He'd got to find the ark. Where did it end up? He's got to find it. And he's going to bring it back to the center of Israel. I said the center of Israel. That was not the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in a place called Gibeon. Five miles down the road was Jerusalem. That was the center. That's where David had his palace. That was... That's where he lived. And he said, this is where I reign. For 20 years, they have not cared whether there's a presence in their tent or not. I'm bringing that ark back to where I live. Now hold it. I mean, things have gotten out of hand. He should never have been in Abinadab's house. God bless him. But to say now officially I'm putting the ark in my backyard no one ever dreamed of that that ark belonged in the tabernacle behind the curtain but no David said I'm bringing it back to Jerusalem and specifically to that part of Jerusalem called Mount Zion and if you've ever been to Israel you, you've been to Mount Zion I'm sure it's, it's a high plot part of Jerusalem but just a minute, you're going to have the ark there without the whole tent. You're going to bring the ark and just have a little tent for the ark. And there it is, open for all of Jerusalem. Yeah. The blood sacrifices of bulls and goats were still going on over there in Gibeon like it had for 20 years. Here... On Mount Zion, you'll have the ark and no sacrifices here. Huh. Now this is something. We, I, it amazes me. You can look at your commentaries. You can look in your Bible dictionaries. They pass over this as if it never happened. <sighs> this is the most important part of the Old Testament. This is a parenthesis. The reign of David. And he did something that nobody could do in the Old Testament to bring that ark out into a tent on Mount Zion within Jerusalem and there to institute a new form of worship that anticipated you and I today in the New Covenant. And so he brought the ark to Jerusalem, found it in the farmhouse. And the, the Bible is very plain. There was, as I say, commentaries skip over these verses. And it speaks to, to Chronicles 1, 3. It says, the high place which was at Gibeon, for God's tent of meeting was there in Gibeon, which Moses, servant of the Lord, made in the wilderness. However, David had brought up the ark of God from Kiriath Jerem to the place he had prepared for it. He had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Right there in the scripture it says, The tabernacle went on with its sacrifices, no ark, no presence. The presence was in another tent on Mount Zion that David had made. Psalm 78 is very plain. It says, So that he, God, the Lord, abandoned the dwelling place at Gibeon, the tent which he'd pitched among them. He chose Mount Zion, which he loved, and he built his sanctuary like the heights. And so Psalm 50 says, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shone forth. Get the picture. It says that David, 1 Chronicles 15, it says, David, when all the elders of Israel, they went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house with joy. This sudden joy erupts in Israel as the glory of God above the ark is now placed on Mount 
Zion and the glory of God shining forth and David assembled choirs and orchestras in order to worship God before the ark 24-7. You can read it. 1 Chronicles 16, there's chapter after chapter on this. It says he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to celebrate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. And the chief among them was a fellow called Asaph. If you've read the Psalms, you've seen his name all over the place. He wrote as many Psalms there as anybody else next to David, Asaph. Well, he was the lead choir director, orchestra coordinator. 1 Chronicles 1637, so David left Asaph and his relatives there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark continually. And it's referred to in the Psalm, Psalm 134. He's it, it, speaking to all these in the choir and the orchestra. He said, Behold, bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord, who serve by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary. Bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you all from Zion. Or again, Psalm 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it's lovely. You know, this really caught on in Jerusalem. Psalm 149, verse 5, it says, let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. The glory of God in the midst of Jerusalem on Mount Zion. They not only worshipped, praised God, sang before Him, banged on their tambourines and blew on their trumpets, twanged on their guitars, but even on their beds it said, that they sang for joy. Now, do, do you get the picture? I mean, I'm going fast here, but, but do you get the picture? Here, on Mount Zion, which is the high place in Jerusalem, and here's David's palace, and there is this tent, and within the tent is the ark of God, and that uncreated glory is there. And in that presence... There are no sacrifices of bulls and lambs and goats. That still happens down there in the silence of the tabernacle where they haven't missed the ark for 20 years. But here on Mount Zion, huh, the noise. I mean, read the Psalms. Now you, I hope you're beginning to understand these Psalms that we call the Book of Psalms, so many of them were composed right there on Mount Zion with hands raised before this glory of God. Psalm 63, he said, Thus I have beheld thee in the sanctuary. Um, and let, let me stop right there. The word sanctuary is what we're talking about. Look, Mount Zion has many other expressions in the Psalms. And so it's called the Tabernacle of David. It's called Holy Hill. It's called, as here, Sanctuary. It's called Your Dwelling. It's called the place of the, the, the ark of your strength. It's called simply tabernacle. It's called Zion. It's called the holy tent. It's called the house of the Lord, as in our text in Psalm 23. It's called the house of God. It's the background when you read of David saying, you are my glory. It's the background to the word refuge. It's the background to the word shield and strength. So he said, I have beheld thee in the sanctuary, in that tent, tent on Mount Zion, the glory of God, he said, I've beheld you to see your power, 
to see your glory in the word glory it means i say again that outshining that penetrating outraying of the glory the radiance of love he says because your loving kindness your covenant love is better than life he said my lips will praise thee so i will bless thee as long as i live i will lift up my hands in thy name my soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness my mouth offers praises with joyful lips he says just to he says to be in your presence and to behold you he says that satisfies my innermost being and I lift up my hands to you and I praise your covenant love. I say again, over at the tabernacle, they offered the sacrifices every day. But here, their sacrifices came out of their mouths. Praise and thanksgiving. They raised their hands, not with sacrifices in them, but raised their hands to say thank you and to worship God. Some people thought it was the Charismatics who invented the raising of hands. No, it goes back at, right here, 1,000 years before Jesus. David, at his tabernacle, instituted this, the raising of the hands. You'll read, and I'm giving you only a smattering of texts here, but they clapped their hands. They even danced before the presence of the Lord. Psalm 107 says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, his covenant love, for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. See, did you understand? They're worshiping with sacrifices, but sacrifices that come out of their mouth of thanksgiving. They tell of his works with joyful singing. And they never get tired. Do you remember Psalm 35? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And they saw that presence. He was the true king shepherd of Israel. And so they says, you are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Psalm 27, 6, he says, I will offer in his tent... That's Mount Zion, where the Ark of the Covenant was. I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Over there in the tabernacle, all you could hear was the shuffle of the feet of the priests and the Levites. Up here on Mount Zion, five miles away, you could hear it a mile away. As the people shouted, praise, clapped, raised their hands and gave glory to God. Psalm 99 says, I will exalt the Lord our God. I will worship at his holy hill, Mount Zion, where the Ark of the Covenant was. Or Psalm 100 calls upon everyone, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, his faithfulness to all generations. And in so doing, David was bringing the covenant relationship, that is the delight of us humans in the God love that wouldn't stop loving us or it was the true meeting it was keeping the appointment it was the lovers tryst as God reached out in love to man, and man and woman came with hands upraised to give thanks and praise to God. David and Asaph, they sat there in the presence of the ark, the presence of the covenant God, and they not only joined in the worship, but they wrote the Psalms. Go back, read the book of Psalms, looking for all those words that describe this one place where the glory of God shone forth. And there they beheld the glory of God. Psalm 27, it says, One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that shall I seek, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, Mount Zion, all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. The word behold, it that's a big word. It means to look, but if you could see my eyes and eyes wide open, sometimes mouth wide open, it means to look and to feast upon what you are looking upon. And so it's, it means in the original language a lingering look, a, a look that will not go away. In the dictionary it calls it a gaze that is chained to what it's looking at, a chained gaze. You're locked in. You can't take your eyes off. It means you're so delighted that you gaze at continually. What is it? What is it they saw when they looked at the Ark of the Covenant and the glory of God? He says the beauty of the Lord. There's another word for you. Beauty. What is beauty? It means it means when you see someone or something that so satisfies your senses. It is ultimate pleasantness. It evokes awe or wonder. It's beauty. And beauty, it means perfect harmony. It's so harmonious, it somehow unites with something inside of me and says this is what it ought to be this is what it should be this is pleasantness this is delight produces sometimes speechlessness it was used in the hebrew language to describe a perfectly fitting garment david says that i may dwell in the house of the lord that i make my, my whole dwelling right here in the presence of the Lord to behold, to be chained to the sight of his beauty, the perfect harmony, the, the pleasantness of God, the rightness of God, that which excites my deepest being. Yeah, this, this is our God. You see, what, what do you think of when you think of God? There, there's many people I don't think I, I don't think you'd be here tonight unless at least you've got a, some of the drift of what I'm saying that when I look at God my heart leaps and yet for I, millions in this world today to think of God is fear to think of God is to cower to think of God is to become uneasy to think of God is anything but beauty. It's a cruel, ugly face of someone who doesn't like me and who's out to get me. Or as someone said in my presence the other day, I believe there is a God and I'll meet him at the end and he'll judge me. <laughs> That's not beauty. No, beauty is I look at him and I'm speaking. He loves me. He is love within himself, the perfection of love. And just to look at him satisfies every sense within me. Yeah, he's love. And he said, and in that to meditate, maybe to, another word, inquire, to pray, to receive instruction, direction for the journey, to meet, to converse, you see. In that presence, they were protected, and strengthened, that, that is, there was coming, that love that came from the glory of God became like a shield around, an invisible shield, and gave them strength to handle life. Again in Psalm 27, he says, In the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. The same word is uh, synonymous for Mount Zion. He will conceal. He'll hide me in that glory. In the secret place of his tent. Same word. He will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. 
I'll be lifted up above my enemies. And I will offer in his tent, there on Mount Zion, sacrifices, shouts of joy. I'll sing, I'll sing praises to the Lord. Isaiah 52 speaks of it as being the place of strength. It says, Awake, awake, clothe yourself in your strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments. David is saying, the prophet said, to be in that presence and to be praising and giving thanks to the God who is above all who is now working out his purpose. It, it is to receive in my innermost being satisfaction and strength. And it's as if I'm clothed in the same beauty that I'm looking at. Remember when Moses went into this presence, he came out and his face was shining. Do you remember that? Psalm 31 speaks of, you do hide them in the secret place of your presence, away from the conspiracies of men. You keep them secretly in a shelter. That was Mount Zion. The shelter was the glory of God. Keep them from the strife of tongues when people are trying to rip you apart. Psalm 20 says, May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. So their, their strength, think about this, their strength was in their joy and their continual praise and giving of thanks to God. Their, you see, joy in God and giving thanks to to God and praising Him because He is the God that He is, that act is the act of opening myself up to who He is. And I enter into union with Him. Do you understand that? That's, that's very important. Their, their joy in God, their giving thanks to Him, open themselves up. It, okay, put it this way, to give thanks to him that he is the beautiful God. He is the beautiful love face. He is the God who loves me and will not let me go. And I give him thanks that he is this beautiful God. And I joy that he is God achieving his plan. In, in the world and also in me. And as I do that, I am hurling light into the darkness. I'm opening up my whole being to that light. And I'm receiving strength. And my whole life is adorned in a beauty. Remember Nehemiah said that, Nehemiah 8. He says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalm 27, we've already keep quoting that, don't we? Now my head will be lifted up above my enemies because I'll offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, sing praises to God. There are many people who don't understand this <clears throat> giving of thanks, this singing praise before God. I, I remember talking to some people and they were most upset that I was exhorting them to fill their day with giving thanks to God. They said, we sing hymns on Sunday. I think nice thoughts about God. Well, I'm glad you do. But I, if you've heard anything of what I'm saying, the presence of God, the throne, if you like, the place where his presence is known, it is the praises of the people of God, singing praise to him, giving thanks that he is the God who is loving kindness and faithfulness. And, and Jesus speaks to this. 
you remember as he comes in his last days, that last week before crucifixion, it says he was approaching Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice. In the Matthew account it says that the Pharisees were very upset. They liked quiet tabernacles over there five miles away. Um, Jesus said, haven't you read, out of the mouth of infants, nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself? Well, actually Jesus was quoting from Psalm 8. But in Psalm 8 it says, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, thou hast established strength. So Jesus equates praising and giving thanks to God. He equates that with establishing strength. And Psalm 8 goes on to say this giving praise to God, which is divine strength, makes the enemy and the revengeful cease. And that means in, it's a big Hebrew word, it, it means cause them to fail, cause them to be put away, to put down, to be gotten rid of. Well, <laughs> unbelievably, when Solomon came to the throne, and I don't want to, what I've just been talking about was a parenthesis, the reign of David, when all of this happened, when all the Psalms took place. Now Solomon comes and he has to, it's not a back step, he builds the temple and they put the ark back in the room behind the curtain and that's where it was. But the prophets never forgot. You read the prophets. They continually talk of Mount Zion. They continually talk of that parenthesis of the tabernacle of David. And one of the prophets, Amos chapter 9, speaking of our day, says, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen close up the holes or the breaches thereof. I will raise up his ruins and build it as in the days of old. He said, there's a day coming when the tabernacle of David again will be the way we live. And now, I think you understand why I need next week. Because all of this, from the Garden of Eden, through Abraham, through the tent in the wilderness, and through the tabernacle of David with the ark, what have you had? You've had humans standing here and the ark of God, whether in the tabernacle or in the tent on Mount Zion, and the presence of God is there. And they were the privileged people, for God was with them. This is all they knew of Emmanuel. But what God was after, and as I say, he was bringing his revelation and it's so slow to us for what I've been talking about here was 1,000 years before Christ it's going to take that time for the people to finally be ready for the ultimate and final tabernacle in John chapter 1 verse 14 it says and the word God the Son became flesh and in your Bibles it says, and dwelt among us. That word dwelt, which is a good word in plain English, but actually that word in the original language is tabernacled or tented. Do you see what John is saying? Finally, that glory that was inside the inner room, the naos, all on Mount Zion now finally comes and is tented inside human no longer human and the glory and their worshiping in the presence but the glory now is tented in flesh and they said, you shall call his name Emmanuel. He, not a tent in the wilderness, not a tent on Mount Zion, but the glory of God is in human. 
the word became flesh and was tented among us and we said John beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth God's glory joined to the human race you and I never to leave us and in his death he fulfilled all the sacrifices and in his death he carried us the illusionary distorted twisted minds our sinful rebellious flesh he carried us to death he resurrected us in his resurrection he joined you to himself who's himself he is Mount Zion he is the glory of God in flesh and he joined you to himself and the Holy Spirit comes in to actualize that so that you become joined to Jesus by the Holy Spirit you become Mount Zion you're not only giving praise to a geographical spot you're inside the glory of God you're embraced by the love of God so that Paul said to the Corinthians 1 Corinthians 3 16 do you not know you are and in our Bibles he says a temple of God the word in the Greek there is naos it means Mount Zion it means the inner sanctum it means where the ark of God and the glory of God are do you not know that you are where the presence of God now dwells and that the Spirit of God dwells is tented in you you become do you know who you are I mean do you really know who you are what I I want you to take everything I've said which I had to say or you'd never understand next week but you are think of this think of this your house has become the very presence of the glory of God. I know people are going to say, boy, I wish, I wish I could see the glory of God on Mount Zion. Well, you'd have to get a plane to New York and then Al Al to Tel Aviv and then a taxi into Jerusalem to get to Mount Zion to look at it, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, you're on the inside now. You're not looking out at it. He is in you. You are in Him. And we fill our days with the giving of thanks. We fill our days with a heart that rises to give praise to a God like this. We're apt to raise our hands. We're apt to clap. We're even apt to tap our feet for joy at the greatness of our God. And out from us then this glory of the love of God reaches, splashes over to everyone around us. Well, I hope this has meant something to you tonight. Um, I, I wanted so much to get into now what that means to us, but I had to establish what this is. David said, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. That is, he said, whatever's going on around me, remember the circumstance he was in, whatever's going on around me, my heart still is on Mount Zion. And my longing is that I live forever in this presence, the house of the Lord. Well, he is and we are. That's where we live. That's when you sit in your office, you do so in the glory of God. As you're working the house, as you're cooking the meals, as you sit in a restaurant, as you walk in the park, as you play football and baseball and look after the children, all that you do within the glory of God and your heart united to Him gives thanks. The fruit of your lips never ceases in one way or another. Of course, uh, this means you don't complain anymore, you don't grumble, you're not a victim anymore. How could you be? You live inside the glory of God. Amen. I've gone over time again, um, but there it is. And I trust that the Holy Spirit uses this to bless you and um, make it real. Fill this incoming week 
with the glory of God. Amen. Now, um, I'm not sure where we are right now with this, because I had to start this thing here. Yeah. Cut that out. There we go. So, you can join us now with your questions, your sharing, and um, let's share together we who are Mount Zion, we who are the glory of God. Yes, Brenda, it is something that, I say it again, the reason I had to take an hour, um, because I don't know how many people who, when they come to the Old Testament, read all those expressions, the house of the Lord, the sanctuary, the tent, the tabernacle, the holy hill, or Mount Zion, or the Holy Hill of Zion. I don't know how many people read that understanding what they're reading. And, um, and so, yeah, it is something that desperately needed and needs to be explained. But you've only heard half next week. Now, what does that mean on those two scriptures I finished with? And there's many, many, many more to follow that Huh. Yeah, Jesus. I mean, do you get it? It's what I, I, I've said it so many times. We think separated. We're still thinking Old Testament. I'm here, glory of God there. We praise God here. We talk to him here. No, in Jesus, the glory of God, God himself, forever joined human. And there's no over here. This is covenant. One plus one <coughs> equals one. Although I never cease to be me, and he never ceases to be he, but we're one. A and that's the new covenant, that we're one with the glory of God. And in that one, and he, the Son who is in us, is in the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the the ultimate facilitator, and he brings us all together. Mount Zion. Okay. Um, yeah, Mount Zion is the foreshadowing. You see, that parenthesis, um, and, and it, I, I don't understand why all the books leave it out, but you have the Tabernacle of Moses, and then parenthesis. Tabernacle of David, where it seems everything is thrown to the wind and we're all dancing in the presence of God. Then, in parenthesis, and Solomon's temple, ark back behind the curtain. But that parenthesis anticipated the new covenant. Yeah. Um, so true, Brenda, have most of us ever known while we're alive? I trust we're learning. hungry heart. I love what you're teaching, but religion has poisoned my soul. I just don't see God as love. Well, all I can say, because I cannot convince anybody, that is why even Paul, in writing the New Testament, when it came to this, prayed. He prayed many, many things, but two things come to mind immediately. The one that I say almost every other week to everybody, that is what I have done. This is not just instruction from an ivory tower. Since I was 17 years old, sometimes three, four times a day, I pray Ephesians 1.17, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Only the Holy Spirit and that makes me feel very much a creature. I'm helpless. I can't think my way to God. I can't study my way to God. The Holy Spirit opens my eyes to see. To see what to us is incredible. Because we've been blinded. When, when Paul was given his personal mandate from Jesus, it was to go to the world, to you and I, to 
open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and, and that, that, that's the essence that's what this ministry is all about that as I proclaim it I proclaim it with that one prayer that every one of you not only hungry heart but every one of you shall see see and hear hear the love that God has for you and the second thing that Paul prayed when he went to Corinth which is what I pray every time I come to talk to you is that what I'm saying to you shall be in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the demonstration of the Spirit and that word means the you know, it, it pulls the rug out from under you and you've got no more arguments left. Um, and, and so that's what I pray. So the Holy Spirit is very involved in this room. So Hungry Heart, pray. Everybody in this room, we're going to pray for Hungry Heart that you will see and you will know in your Hungry Heart the love of God. And, and you say there also that one day you'll understand the Trinity. Um, why don't we leave it at this? Just know that Father loves you. Don't try and understand it. And I mean this to all of us. Do not try to figure out the Trinity. Just know that Father loves you and He so loved you that he sends the Son and the Son comes and where the Son is the Father is and the Son so loved you he got inside your skin got inside your head and heart became us so that his history is ours and God the Spirit sent by the Father so loves you that he takes a permanent resident within you now I don't understand that that's the truth oh I lecture on it but the biggest thing is when we pray and open up to the Father and know we're right in His presence through the Son and the Holy Spirit is doing a dance within us. Don't understand it, hungry heart. Don't try and understand it. Just enjoy that this incredible God has you in the center of His embrace. And this is the neat thing. Even though you don't understand it, He still has you in His arms. Your, your brain will catch up to where you are. Claude, I always thought that the I will live in the house of the Lord was meaning living in God's family forever. Was I way off? No, not at all, because God's family is in that circle of love that I, I call the Holy Trinity, that, that dance of God love. The, the family of God is inside the Father because we're inside the Son because we're inside the Holy Spirit and Father, Son and Holy Spirit are inside of us. And, and so you're actually, actually you're right on. The family of God, the house of the Lord is Mount Zion. And I'll anticipate next week in Hebrews 12, it says of us, we have come to Mount Zion. Yes, the family of God. So, uh, Tom, are we sinless? Well, you see right there, you're, you're getting mixed up with that old um, idea of sin as breaking laws. The fact is, you are the righteousness of God. And righteous means, righteous, um, again, d don't interpret it by that old definition of I'm keeping the law, therefore I'm righteous. Righteousness is a covenant word which means walking in harmony in covenant love. And in harmony with the God who loves us, our response is, thank you. And I now live that that love is reality. And so I live righteous. That is, I am living, trusting in his love. And his love has forgiven us. His love has wiped us clean. His love has broken the authority of sin in our life. So the idea of sinless belongs to the old, you know, with glasses on the end of their nose, uh, high court judges. 
No, um, think of it more that you are um, walking with, with the Lord in his love, and that's all you have to know, for that is the righteousness of God. And he gave it to you. Did You didn't earn that. Um, he gave you that love, and he inspired you by his spirit to trust in that love, and then he witnesses to you, you're his child. So it's his righteousness, and you're walking in Christ, in the Father. I hope that answers. Uh, to me, I, I see immediately, you know, use these words and I smell a rat, but um, I know you don't mean that, Tom, but think of it like that. Uh, it, it's not, have I kept the law today? That, that's, then I'd be sinless. No, that, that's old thinking of judges and punishment and courtrooms. No, righteousness of God means you're sitting at the Holy Trinity kitchen table and you're having a laugh of joy with the Father through the Son by the Spirit. And that's righteousness. So, um, and, and to carry maybe what you're after, um, such a person, I mean, we don't want to go back to the old way. The To leave that kitchen table, to go back into the darkness to say, I'm my own boss, I do things my way. No, no, no. So John says, if, if you dwell in God, which is what I've been saying, then uh, we do not continually sin. No, we don't. Sin does not have dominion over us. We, we've been there. We don't want to go back there. We're resting in the love of God, and we walk out into the world, and that love is our directive. Um, Helene, we live in a desert and you're the one of the few voices announcing these beautiful truths. May the Holy Spirit spread this marvelous truth all over the earth. Amen. And you know, Helene, we're closer to doing that right now than we've ever been before because this program is being listened to um, every week by many, many thousands of people in at least 30 countries the last time we checked. So, um, for some reason I got a fleeting insight to the truth of God's love for us when he provided a way back to him through Jesus. Then give thanks for that fleeting insight and pray the Holy Spirit make that insight to become your whole life. I know exactly what you mean. I remember those fleeting insights. They could just have me sit in my seat <clears throat> almost mindless for an hour trying to write down what I'd seen. But yeah, it's the Holy... That fleeting insight was the Holy Spirit. Now just give Him thanks and open up to receive more. Um, absolutely, Lexi. You're free from the law. And so our response to that glory who now dwells within us by the Spirit is we sing, we dance before the Lord. Try it in your bedroom. I, 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 I was speaking to a group of people once. I won't say of which denominations. But I was talking about giving praise to God. Spontaneous and free, just saying thank you to the Lord. And um, I could see by the look on their face, they were terrified of what I was saying. If I'm more at home in a silent tabernacle five miles down the road. And, and, um, and so I said, go home and, and go into your bedroom, lock the door, put a brown paper bag over your head, and then begin to sing praise, raise your hands, and do a tap dance before the Lord. Do you know some actually did that? And they came back and said they were suddenly free. So, yeah, that's the truth, Lexi. Um... Beautiful sermon brought to mind how man was unable to remain in the presence of God during the Old Testament without experiencing death from the radiance of God. That, um, which is a reference to Yuza who touched the ark, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, but because, uh, I mean, you, you're, I, I know what you're talking about. Because, as I said, the human was here, the glory was there. And man was not allowed just to go in and sort of hang out in the holy place. And when Yuza um, touched the ark, it was because they'd put it on a cart, 
pulled by oxen, which was, no, that's not the way you were to carry the ark. The exact instructions were in um, the Old Testament book of the law and, and not in an ark. And of course, when the oxen hit a rock and the ark nearly fell off and Uzzah stopped and grabbed it, the whole thing was chaos. And um, But just remember, the, the important point is that what I said, the human was here, the glory was there, he was with them, he was with them. But where we are, this is what Jesus did, this is the center of the gospel. Jesus said, he is with you, he shall be in you. And he said, in that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This is the new covenant, that now we're inside the glory of God. And um, that's, that's the point. In the old, he was as close and yet removed. Because God was not yet human. But in the incarnation, he became human. And the incarnation continues now and forever because right now, still joined to you and me in our humanness, he's inside the Father, which means we're in there with him. And that's the difference. But um, your, your question actually could take an hour, sort of Bible school hour. So, Katie, this has been one of those days that my 24-7 pain has been so unrelenting and I so needed tonight to be reminded of the love of God that he will get me through this day. And may your very body, may the cells of your body, Katie, be filled with the healing, life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit. And that you shall know relief from pain and the healing to your body. Shirley. In the light of this truth of one with him, what about when feeling depression? Sometimes depression is <clears throat> something for actual physical healing because there, there's, um, the chemicals of the brain are not doing what they should do. And that needs healing. And that any healing is founded upon this fact that the healer himself dwells within you. And many times depression is due to our looking out at life as if all that I've said tonight isn't true. And I don't want that to sound cruel, but anxiety, worry, fear in the Bible is always viewed as having a wrong or inadequate view of who God is. When I'm anxious and worrying, and hopeless and in despair, it means that I am thinking as if and acting as if God is not love joined to me. And therefore the end of that road depression is uh, that taken to the nth degree, utter hopelessness. And in that case, then we deliberately, without a feeling in any fiber of our body, begin to give thanks and praise to God that He is who He is, that He does dwell within us, that He does fill His creation, and His light fills our life. And I'm thinking of someone right now who for one hour without a feeling in their depressed mind or body. They did not feel a thing, but they, in their bedroom, gave praise to God because that's the truth. Truth is beyond all our feelings sometimes, and certainly it's always truth comes first, feelings a poor second. And at the end of that hour of praising God by simply trusting the truth, um, then uh, th there was not only relief, there was a rising of joy. A and so if the depression is due to a chemical imbalance that needs uh, a gift of healing, then uh, he who dwells within you is the source of that healing. 
and one should be prayed for and one should pray for healing but for many of us who drift down that road of depression and hopelessness we stop and we deliberately give praise to God um, thank God for CDs and praise music that can fill our house with these very Psalms that we, we've been talking about and so um, anyway uh, that, that could do a whole hour there but I hope what I just said helps you yeah um, but now in Christ we're back to the yeah the the death that touched the ark but now in Christ this very radiance dwells in each of us incredible my brother you see and we're, this is next week and th this is why I wanted to get there but I wanted this week too it says your body is the naos which means in plain English, and it also says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, which we'll look at, um, that the Shekinah glory, this unspeakable glory of God now dwells in us and dwells upon us like a tent. That's it. Um, <clears throat> we're coming to an end here. Um, What does God feel like inside of me? Uh, sometimes you don't feel anything. Right as I'm speaking to you right now, I don't feel anything in the sense that maybe you, you may mean feel. There have been times in my life, and I mean times, you know, I could count them. And I'm a very old man right now, and so over the last 60 plus years there have been moments in my life when I have felt the rising of joy unspeakable when I have felt in my very body the presence of God but normally day by day day by day I simply know at a level that is deeper than thinking about that I'm a child of God, that He is my daddy, and that in Him I live and move and have my being. And we chat and we talk together all day long. And so, I, I th this is the point, and a couple of three weeks ago we talked about it quite a bit and it got a lot of press when I said, act as if. As you act as if, his presence dwells in you well you're there you see we're, we're raised in an environment that wants an experience and then to feel something afterward whereas the New Testament says this is the good news see I you we entered into the father's heart 2,000 years ago in the ascension of Jesus you and I ascended into the father and the Holy Spirit came and began celebrating that joining us together and so I was born into that and so my I, I'm there that's my home and I I take that and I spend my days on my Mount Zion giving thanks to God um, and Bob you're right the Pharisee never gets to dance no <laughs> Pharisees believe dancing is the devil um, it's very sad uh, that the Pharisee equates holiness with misery they, they equate reverence with dead silence and heavy on the word dead uh, no Pharisees do not know joy they do not know rejoice because those words have nothing to do with keeping a law they have everything to do with relationship when two lovers are lost in each other's embrace which is the gospel which is what Jesus came to do um, exactly Lexi what I just said God used David to show us what kind of relationship he wants. Not hung up on keeping rules, but trusting God to take care of it and just enjoy him. 
Yes, that's true, Hungry Hog. The starch of religion. Okay. Maybe Lex's comment is a good place to quit. Praise the Lord, Malcolm. My whole view of God changed tonight. You have no idea. I'm so excited. And may that be true of everyone. And as we close, may I encourage all of you to go to that box on your screen where it says donate. Um, this is a hard thing to say. I'm not good at this. But whenever there is a disaster like all of the uh, earthquakes that we've got, the tsunamis, and now the tornadoes and the flooding, um, our donations, we, we have partners and they're committed with us to this message to the world and they just keep on giving faithfully. But we have many other people who donate uh, as, as they feel led. And whenever there's a disaster anywhere in the world, our donations plummet because they're giving donations to other um, worthy causes. And I, I find that very difficult to say because I say amen to their giving. Um, those, those people desperately need it. But I would just encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit because um, our, our donations plummet. Whenever there's a disaster in the world, uh, we feel it in our mail and website. And so let the Holy Spirit lead you in that little button, donate. Anyway, it's been great to be with you all. And now may the blessing of God, God the great lover, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, May his blessing rest upon you, enlighten you. May you know his embrace in your heart and be carried in his strength into this week and unto the ages of ages. Amen and amen.